I am about to go and do something that I am not allowed to do. Thank you. Have a good day. Even now, after experiencing that, like holding this, I still have conflict in my soul. It still feels weird because I've been told for 26 years that coffee is bad. Um, I have been a member of the Mormon church and I have recently decided just in September to uh, step back from that. For years, I have been uh, struggling with several things and struggling is not the right word, just having a lot of questions about stuff. And I have recently been more open to the fact that I need to be questioning things that I believe myself. And so just through the process of research and examining my own ideas, I have stepped away. So in today's video, I'm going to talk about belief structures. We're going to talk about why we believe the things we believe, why it's so easy to sort of just go with the crowd versus being a critical thinker yourself. And then I'm going to get into these three books. And I really think if you are somebody who feels conflicted, who wants to start thinking uh, for yourself and on your own terms and living life for yourself, I am hoping that this message will ring true for you. All right, let's get into it. Okay, into the meat of the books. Again, as you know, I've been taking the free Yale philosophy course and this week was so needed for me. It was so refreshing because I have just been you know, wandering in my belief systems. And it's weird when you leave a major religion, especially a high demand religion like the Mormon church, um, you experience all of the um, effects of grief, like you almost lose something that was really important to you. But these books have helped, and this course has really helped. Uh, I have learned that it is up to me to make meaning in my own life. And this is one of the books that I'm learning from. So this is Jonathan Haidt's The Happiness Hypothesis. This is one of the main readings in the Yale course. Now the course is titled uh, The Parts of the Soul. There's two sessions. This is the first session. And the point here is that as human beings, we are naturally divided. And philosophers for you know, thousands of years have been trying to explain this in words. And so we're gonna go over three main ideas today. So in the happiness hypothesis, uh, Mr. Haight here, who's an alumnus of Yale, has a really great picture on the cover of his book. I don't know if you can see this, but there's a, an elephant swimming in the water. And then right up top, there's a little guy up there riding on the elephant. Well, that is an analogy that he uses to explain the divided soul. The divided soul is simply the fact that you are made up of reason and emotions. And for thousands of years, philosophers have taught that the well-ordered soul is one that is listening to reason. And you're making all of your decisions by reason. And that, that sounds right, doesn't it? Like you want to make the most rational choice. You want to do what is best for you and, and your future, but <clears throat> Then comes philosophers like David Hume and others who say, yeah, that sounds good on paper, but that's not how we actually are as human beings. What actually happens is that we are passionate creatures who have desire and appetite and other things that really are difficult to control. And I don't always do what's best for myself in my own interests. And so the analogy here is that the little writer up on top is your reasoning capability. That's the part of your soul that reasons. And the elephant, the thing that walks on the ground, that's big and massive, those are your interests and your passions and your appetites. Now, you as the reasonable, the reasonable part, are, you know, you try to navigate this elephant and tell it to turn left or to turn right by yanking on the cords. Most of the time it will listen and say, yeah, sure, okay, we'll go left or right. But sometimes that elephant goes in the wrong direction and there's not a lot you can do about it. How many times have you gotten a paycheck and thought, man, I want to put all of this into my savings account for retirement <laughs> rather than going out and splurging on something right now and having a great time with that money. If you are super, super disciplined, then you're putting some of your money into uh, the future, but people don't always do that. And what these philosophers are trying to point out is that if you understand that about yourself, the fact that your emotions are the thing that you're trying to control and that that is the, the basis for everything you're doing, you actually have a clear sort of mode for making better decisions and for, for really starting to think critically about your own life. 
The second book that has helped me feel far more grounded recently is Plato's Phaedrus. It's spelled P-H-A-E-D-R-U-S. In Plato's Phaedrus, this is a dialogue between Plato's teacher Socrates and Phaedrus, who's a, an orator, and he shares the story of Plato's charioteer. It's what it's called. And so we're actually going to watch this part of the lecture from Yale's philosophy course today. And we're going to learn from uh, Ms. Gendler this story and talk about how it applies to our feeling uh, conflicted, happy, sad, all of the human traits you feel. All right, let's jump into it. So in the somewhat salacious material from Plato that I had you read today, I hope you read it. It's really racy and really fun. It's racy because this is a story of a man driving a charioteer or a chariot, uh, and he's being led by these horses towards his um, biggest, deepest desire, which is the love of a young man in the city. So let's, uh, it's a little racy. <laughs> it's funny because in the Yell course, she actually wrote in the reading notes. Uh, this is the only R-rated thing we'll be reading this semester. Sorry, everybody. That was kind of funny. Okay, here we go. So in it, Plato, here's a wonderful depiction of it by a philosopher named John Holbo who lives in Singapore. Plato describes the three parts of the human soul. The first is what he calls reason or logos. This is represented here by the charioteer. The second, spirit sometimes translated as honor or thumos, and the third, appetite or epithumos. So notice the correlation between what Jonathan Haidt taught us in the happiness hypothesis with reason and passion or emotion, right? Reason being the little guy driving on the elephant and passion being the big elephant that's hard to control. Plato came several thousand years before Jonathan Haidt, and had a similar idea. Plato really is the cornerstone of all Western civilization, uh, or uh, Western philosophy, uh, rather. It's often been said that pretty much everything we've ever thought or discussed is really just a footnote to Plato's thinking. So he had a lot to say. But here we have three variables. We've got reason, we've got honor or spirit, and then we've got appetite, right? So Really, honor and spirit, those are your passions, the good kind and the bad kind, and then you've still got reason. Now, Plato presents a number of metaphors by which we can understand this. In the Republic, in a passage which we're reading for early next week, he describes reason as a human being, spirit as a lion, and appetite as a multi-headed beast. And in the passage that we read for today from the Phaedrus, he describes reason as a charioteer, spirit as a good horse, noble in frame, well-jointed, with a high neck and regal bearing. His coat is white, and he is controllable by word alone. Okay, let's stop there for just a minute and point out that, so again, try to picture in your mind the charioteer who's reason. That's, that's the part of you that's supposed to do what's best for you and also um, make moral sense, right? You do what's best for the greater good. You do the logical thing, although we know we don't always do the logical thing. And that reasonable part of you is holding onto the reins, which are attached to two different horses. She's just described the first horse, the horse of spirit or honor. This horse is beautiful. It does everything it's asked. It's just a great horse. Appetite, by contrast, on the platonic picture, is a great crooked jumble of limbs with a short bull neck, a pug nose, dark skin, bloodshot white eyes, companion to wild boasts and indecency, shaggy around the ears, deaf as a post, barely yielding to the horsewhip and the goad combined. And, and that is the ugly side of your passion. I love, my favorite part of that is the death as a post thing. And what this means is that the charioteer has this also horrible horse attached to his chariot, and it doesn't listen to anything. It's deaf as a post, and he can whip it and hit it with the goad. None of that works, barely at all. He can 
barely control this horse, it's just gonna go nuts the entire time. I don't know if you can relate to that, but we all have these two horses inside of us. Your passions might be a shopping addiction, or you might have an alcohol addiction, or you might just stay up too late when you know you shouldn't because you gotta get up the next morning. Maybe you eat four cupcakes at the family party instead of one. You have an ugly horse, just like me. <laughs> now goes on to describe in the passage that we read today, a rather exciting event where a man of Athens has fallen in love with a young boy, and the brown horse within him. So hit, hit pause there. This is, of course, a, a homosexual-based story which back then was uh, quite prominent between uh, wealthy and uh, you know, not so wealthy people. Um, people had different thoughts about sexuality than they do now, which is another belief system I find absolutely fascinating. The fact that um, you know, whether it's Christianity or governments or whatever have shaped the way we think, it's, it's, it's wild to think that uh, we can just completely shift as a society based off of some rules that some person made. So think about that. Within him, his appetites are ready to engage in those activities which fell into the category of things that Freud talked about in the id. Okay, we'll get to Freud's id after this. That's the third book. And I don't mean that he wanted to eat lunch with the young boy. Whereas spirit is attracted but recognizes the ways in which there are social norms, and the charioteer is involved in trying to keep them in line. So Socrates writes of the process by which the charioteer tries to bring the dark horse into line, as the dark horse basically tries to get the man to embrace his young beloved. So I don't know if you've ever experienced that, where you're in the throes of some passion and you've had to try and get your dark horse in line. If you're human, you've experienced that. So he says... Uh, the promised time arrives, the horses pretend to have forgotten what they were told by the charioteer. It reminds them. The horse struggles, it neighs, it pulls them forward, it forces them to approach the boy again with the same proposition, and as soon as they are near, it drops its head, straightens its tail, bites the bit, and pulls towards the boy without any shame at all. The charioteer, that is reason, self-regulation, the superego, the prefrontal cortex. is. We'll talk about superego next. Again, that's a Sigmund Freud term. Something that uh, I have been struggling with because of religion. Struck with the same feelings as before, right? He feels like this is not activity that he wants to engage in. Only worse, and he's... Okay, that's a big statement. The charioteer knows this isn't... This is an activity I don't want to do, but I'm being compelled towards it. Something inside me is drawing me to this thing. And you'll notice how hard he is fighting against that horse. He's trying to pull, and that horse is digging in, and they are at complete odds with each other. I mean, this is powerful stuff. This was written thousands of years ago, you guys. And Plato, Plato was a genius. Uh, he, he was a, a complete genius. Falling back as he would from a starting gate, he violently yanks the bit back out of the teeth of the insolent horse, harder this time so that he bloodies its foul-speaking tongue and jaws, sets its legs and haunches firmly on the ground, and causes it to stop. Now, this idea that one of the ways in which we learn to control our passions is by training ourselves as we would train a wild animal through the creation of negative associations with certain sorts of activities is, in fact, a fundamental insight about how human self-regulation takes place. 
and with Okay, so I'm going to stop it there, and if you want to watch the rest of the lecture, I highly encourage that you do. It is, um, it is an incredible, I don't know, it's, it's 45 minutes, and it is well worth your time. We only watched a few minutes today. However, I want to point out that this, this allegory is something I think that we can all relate to, and I want you to think about how hard the charioteer has to work to stop that horse. Now, I want you to keep that in mind because I'm going to bring this back to my experience of leaving or stepping away from the Mormon church at the end of this video. So if you're curious to figure out what all this has to do with my experience, I'll get to it, but we need to get to the third book first. The third book that we read this week was Sigmund Freud's The Ego and the Id. Now, it's a very small uh, read, but it is quite challenging to get through if you're not used to some of these uh, terms. Now, you might have heard of the ego and the id. It's brought up a lot. And a lot of Freud's ideas have been disproved now. Uh, you know, people have come along and found more accurate ways to describe the conditions of the human soul and why we are unhappy or happy or whatever. But his work was foundational for helping us understand ourselves today. Now we're going to talk about Freud's the ego and the id. And in fact, there's a third term called the superego. So quickly, what this means is that the ego is your current consciousness. It's the bit of you that engages with current reality. So if you sit down, like for me right, right now, for example, I'm making a video for you. And so my conscience is thinking about this video. That is the ego. It's, it's thinking about that, right? The id is my passions or my appetite. And then the superego is uh, sort of your bigger cultural connection. It's all of the rules you've learned from your family, from your religion, from your government that govern the way you feel and the way you make your decisions. Those are the things that create shame and pride and all that other stuff, right? So the analogy here is, and I love this, it's much akin to a person driving a stagecoach. We've got lots of drivers and horses today. But in this analogy, the stagecoach person who's driving it is the ego, right? That's the person who is consciously aware of the activity happening. And then the, uh, the id is the horses, of course, running wildly away, just like Plato's charioteer. So nothing new here yet. Uh, but both horses now are just nuts because you're being pulled by anger and passion or whatever. But the bit that I like most about this analogy is the superego. This is, it, in this part of the story, this is akin to your father who's sitting in the back of the stagecoach with his arms crossed, watching everything you do and lecturing you on how to do it <laughs> and making you feel bad all along the way as you make mistakes. Let's bring all of this together now and talk about how these three books relate to what it's like to leave a high demand religion or a job or a relationship that's not working for you or a diet plan that you're addicted to. Whatever it is, you are attached to some sort of belief system that isn't maybe serving your, your um, values the way that it should. So that is hard to do. and. What I want to point out here is that in all three of these books, we had the elephant and the rider, which is reason and passion. Plato, we had the charioteer, which is reason with a good horse, an honorable horse, and an appetite horse, just the crazy horse. And then we had Sigmund Freud. And in that analogy, it was the guy driving the, um, the coach. And then you had the dad in the back, the super ego lecturing you about all the things you're doing wrong and how you're just not conforming the way you're supposed to. Uh, boy, I, don't like that voice, but it's there for all of us. Well, because of my experience over the past 20 years, I think the main reason why I decided to step away is because in all three of those stories, there is a component of reason. The driver, the charioteer, and the coach driver. Those are the reasons. That, that is you holding onto the reins. Well, by being a member of this church, I gave away my reason, and I just blindly trusted and did what I was told. And so I'm facing every day of my life trying to control horses with a set of rules I didn't create, uh, with a set of um, value systems that didn't come from me. Uh, and um, quite honestly, 
it, it's really hard to sort of show up every day and feel connected and feel happy. And so when I stepped away from the church, I grabbed those reins, right? I grabbed the elephant by the ears, and, you know, and um, for the first time ever, I could say, let's go left because that's what I believe in. Let's go right because that's, that's my value system. Now, here's the beautiful thing. Am I gonna make mistakes as a human being? Absolutely. Am I going to be conflicted still? Absolutely. But the difference is that I am now the reason in my head. I am now the one thinking critically for myself. I am now the one who gets to live my life for me. And I think that's the greatest gift any of us can have as human beings. To let each one of us be ourselves and to, to wish them well on their journey of life, right? We should stop trying to control each other and, and, and add belief systems. We should read more books so we can figure out what we believe in and what we don't believe in. And we should question everything that's presented to us. I'd like to ask a quick question. Uh, and if you could answer this in the comments down below, I just think this would be fascinating. Uh, so for you in your own personal life, what have you learned at your stage that is helping you to think for yourself? Uh, now, it doesn't matter if you're five years old or you're 90 years old. What have you done to begin thinking for yourself? And what has that been like? I'm just curious. I would love to get a discussion going down below. Uh, I just, I love hearing people's stories about um, beginning to believe in themselves and not having to be so reliant on the outside world. Hey, thanks for watching. Uh, my name's Eddie. This is the Read Well Podcast, where we believe that we should read slowly, take notes, and apply the ideas. Hey, I'll see you guys next time.